have to think about as to how much we have to grow. <laughs> Europe is so far ahead of where we are in the Caribbean, but the, the three primary acts he mentioned seem to cover a lot of what we're facing here in the Caribbean in terms of needing to regulate how the internet is affecting us as individuals and therefore how, how the society is growing. Um, we, we come from a, we're in a practice steeped in tradition and precedent and what he has shown us is how far we have to go, um, how much growth there is, how much there is to, to regulate. Um, it's, it's quite a lot. <laughs> Yes, it is quite a lot. And Naima, as you said, um, we in the region, we are um, ourselves trying to grapple with operating within our region, but also operating on an international stage. So as a uh, civil law and um, commercial law practitioner, um, what I'm finding is that regional businesses are trying to figure out how to stay ahead or even stay in tandem with what the digital economy is doing uh, overseas. So that even as they try to be on the internet and, and, and tap into the global economy, um, they have to be dealing with that internet space, which as Dan pointed out, can be, it's a lot to navigate because they have to be dealing with data, data privacy laws, um, the GDPR, um, Barbados's um, GDPR is very similar to, to that of the European standard, which is a higher standard I know, but it is tough for businesses to begin to navigate that um, privacy policies and using the technology as a key tool in the operations while, of course, being aware that overseas, there's more robust litigation on these issues than perhaps here in the region? I, I think that as a region, we will have to be looking to, 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 to Europe um, for, for precedent in terms of how to deal with the impact of the law um, society, how all of these things are affected by the internet. It, it broadens not just our um, scope to regional, but we will be looking abroad for, for guidance, for, for precedent, for um, direction as to how to treat with things as simple as, as defamation, something as simple as that. We, we've gotten to the point here in Belize where we're recognizing how, how Facebook is, is affecting people and we're talking about us as Belizeans thinking that we can sit in our, in our little offices and type what we want and, so, and seeing that it it's getting as far as, as, as the United States and it's going above and therefore the damages that you're being assessed with. The, the whole scope and platform of our practice is changing, not just to a regional one, but an international one. The internet has made it so that we're, uh, what we consider in terms of our scope, it's, it's just, it's extended so far. I couldn't agree with you more, Naima. Sorry, Dan. Please go oh, yeah, sorry. I may say, yes, you mentioned, uh, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, defamation, because I actually jotted down that I would speak about that, but I did, couldn't speak about everything in my intro. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Um, you may know that one of the cases that I worked on was the right to be forgotten. And you probably all know what that means in general terms. Uh, the right to be forgotten is really the right, which you find in the GDPR in Article 17 which should not be confused with the right to rectification, which is Article 16. Uh, the right to rectification means that something is true, uh, something is not true, sorry, <laughs> and, and, you want it, and you want it rectified, while the right to be forgotten is that something is true, but for various reasons, it should be forgotten, right? Okay. Um, and uh, so when you talk about defamation, sometimes you are in 16, sometimes you are in 17, sometimes you are in both. These cases are extremely interesting, and we we'll probably get them. I think that we, 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 since the famous judgment, which came down on the 13th of May 2014 from the European Court of Justice, creating, creating the, the right to be forgotten, I think we, we probably get one every week from all over the world, all over the world. I mean, the latest one we got from Russia, 
Of course, the problem is that our poor Russian friends, and I guess it's the same for you, um, they don't have a right to be forgotten in their, in their national legislation. So what they do, and I think that's very symptomatic of people looking towards Europe, which is so they try and get some sort of protection through the European uh, GDPR in this particular case, and the case I mentioned before from, the, from 2014. Um, but of course they can't because they are not data subjects in Europe. And some of these people even go so far, listen to this, so, uh, uh, some of these people even go so far that they officially domicile them, themselves in Europe to pretend that they live in Europe. And that shows how desperate you are because of course uh, it's, it's, it's not fairly legal what they're doing. And in order to, you know, to, to give the impression because the, the, uh, the, the companies in question, this is especially Google, will, um, will look into this matter and find out whether you really live, whether you, whether you pretend that you live. And there are of course criminal sanctions and so on and so forth. I'm just giving you these examples. There was, another, there was even a case in the UK of someone who, who, who sent Google a forged uh, uh, court decision um, condemning someone of, um, of defamation and enjoining that individual to have the defamatory search keynote, search criteria, the, 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 the keywords taken off Google. That was a forgery. That was a forgery. But why did he do that? And why do people in Russia come to see us? Because their life depends on this. And that's the point I want to make. If somebody says something about you on the internet, you're dead. You know, of course, well, indeed, you're dead. Dan, you're I dead, think you're dead. You're, you can't yeah. do anything, you know? And then yeah. you're fighting against monsters who don't care about anything. They just get advertising <laughs> revenue because they get more revenue if there's dirt than, than, than the opposite. And mm -hmm. at the same time, people are dying. So this is, and, and people commit criminal acts in order to get under the protection of Europe. So this is something that I can tell you that I get almost every day and I'm pretty uh, uh, upset about what I, what I see. And if there is any recommendation that I could give to, to, to you and your, your part of the world, you should definitely look at this because to me, to me, it has become a human right that you have the right to be forgotten. Yeah. I mean, yeah. just, look at, just look at a criminal policy, right? You go to prison, you serve your sentence, you're free, you start a new life. But the internet never forgets, you never start a new life. I, I have a, a, a yes, client, a Greek, a Greek client, who was, you know, he, he, was he, he was charged with some criminal offense and actually nothing ever happened because, uh, because the, the, case, the case never, never got further than that. There was some stupid article about him in the press somewhere and it's still there 10 years after. And when he goes to see a bank, They'll find this stupid article and say, "What happened? Did you, did, you know, his life is finished." <laughs> so I mean, this is something very, very important. And it Please will follow him into his it employment. In yes, it will follow him into his employment for years to come. I think what you are speaking of is that there are basic human rights which we all there's an expectation that they will be protected, and. Um, Perhaps uh, jurisdictions, I believe, like Trinidad are a little bit more robust than other Caribbean jurisdictions. There have been one or two cases, but typically it isn't as robust in the region, certainly not in Barbados, as of course it would be in other jurisdictions. So, so let me jump in here and, and riveting discussion so far. I think um, going back to your presentation, uh, uh, Dan, it really highlights um, you know, the need perhaps for greater scrutiny in terms of uh, registration beyond where the companies operate typically in the United States um, within countries and regions where they have a tremendous user base to you know ex expand some of the liabilities in terms of the right uh, to be forgotten where those rights have been enshrined into local law um, beyond the economic benefits generally that would be brought about if these companies were required to have a greater presence um, in those jurisdictions. But I also want to indicate for the rest of the participants that this is an open forum. Um, it is being led by our discussants here, but uh, you are free to um, also join the discussion. I'm also being told that uh, Justice Bernard Turner uh, would like to make a comment. And so um, I also would invite him to speak, Donovan as well. If you have anything to add, please feel free to jump in. Uh, Justice Turner, are you there?
Donovan is there, so let's go. Donovan, let's I, I, I see Donovan. I'm yeah. not seeing Justice Turner uh, from the Bahamas. Uh, just, uh, right. just so. Okay. Uh, uh, my contribution, of course. I mean, thank you, Dan. That was an excellent overview, and the comments by Naim and K are well appreciated. Um, I just thought that for our participants, it would be useful to um, just share some information basic information so as to so we understand the kind of world that we're living in according to some research that i just did um the power of big data is amazing every minute that we are alive facebook users share 2.5 million pieces of content twitter users tweet 300,000 times Instagram users post nearly 220,000 photographs. YouTube users upload 72 hours of new video. App users download 50,000 apps, and Amazon has over 100,000 US dollars in online sales every minute. We focus, so that's the big data environment that we're living in. And what I found in terms of governance, and perhaps this relates to the Digital Governance Act, is as lawyers, we do face from a practice perspective, legal and ethical issues in technology. So the, the, the president, the chief executive officer of the Solicitors Regulation Authority in the UK, Paul Phillip, um, shared the statistic in 2017 that over 130,000 UK solicitors were issued with a letter warning them about rudeness and causing offences when using social media or in letters and emails. And Paul, in his report to the Solicitors Regulation Authority, says, we expect solicitors to act at all times with integrity, including on social media, and when commenting in what may seem to be a personal capacity. Solicitors cannot justify their conduct by saying that the communication was private or they did not intend to cause offense or that recipients were not offended. So, I mean, to me, it makes it clear that all lawyers, including those in the Caribbean, should think carefully as we use um, online platforms, as we use social media, and consider implications that it could have on our respective practices and career. And I just wanted to find out from you, Dan, Kay, and Naima, what your thoughts are on the practice of law in the time of big data. Do you think that Paul Phillips' um, warning to us about solicitors is appropriate? And do you think it's important in the Caribbean context? Thank you. Just before uh, Dan goes, I just wanna um, get some comments from the chat. Uh, we have um, uh, Rodney talking about uh, the monetization being in the data. And so needing to have rules that address the reality that is not the simple uh, economic incentives uh, in traditional business because the value is in the data and, and pretty much the client we the users are the data um, in terms of the impact of, of you know the large social media platforms and we need rules to deal with that and then as well um, Cherie Small uh, commenting talks about um, the rise of human rights abuses uh, in the region and um, the need for the legal, the legal field to deal with that so just some comments from the chat as well I just want to insert those into the discussion. Um, Dan? Yeah, um, there's a lot to say about The first thing is from, from Donovan, the, the, uh, the question of uh, the special obligations on our legal profession in terms of communication on the internet and so on and so forth. I know that, you're, that you're, your remarks were broader than that, but let me just try and, and address that. One of, the, one of the major concerns that I personally have and is growing 
is the presumption of innocence on social media. I know because I've had occasion to discuss that with, with judges, that of course it has an impact, of course it has. And again, if you're interested, it's also part of the, of the, of the study that I made for the American Law Institute, and I'd be happy to send you on profiling of judges because it's part of it. Now, the, the concern that we have here is really, how do we strike a balance between what is good, which is the Me Too movement, and the abuse of that, which is the direct attack on the presumption of innocence. And how, do we, how does that relate to the different cultures that we have on either side of the Atlantic, where political correct speech is very different in Europe, and actually Europe is 27 different countries, um, as opposed or as compared to the US. Um, as, as lawyers in private practice, um, I, I would think that it is our obligation in no way to share on social media information that could put at jeopardy the principle of the presumption of innocence. Absolutely. And I may also add to that, that uh, I've even made a proposal to the European Commission that a special offense, penal offense should be created in Europe which is the offense of putting at jeopardy the presumption of innocence in itself on social media. It's working its, through, its way through the arcanes of, of the European Commission. And I, and I actually also been invited to join a special committee uh, that was created in France, uh, which is headed up by the former French Minister of Justice at the behest of President Macron. So this is something that, that, that concerns us all and we see that the impact it has. On the other hand, it's not completely new because we've always had, um, we've always had restrictions or at least ethical restrictions of lawyers communicated with classic media, right? On cases and media coverage, which could either be used for or against your client and so on and so forth. And here I should also share with you in the interest of full disclosure that I am a member of the executive bureau of Reporters Without Borders. And, 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 and you, you may find it interesting to know that um, we also feel that there is an obligation uh, for reporters and for, and for media to respect the presumption of innocence um, in general. But of course, I would say that there is an even stronger obligation um, on the legal profession. So I, I so totally share your concern. I know it's broader than just the presumption of innocence, but to me, if we don't, if we don't protect the presumption of innocence, our, our, our whole trust in the judiciary is going to fall apart. And if that falls apart, this is the most important pillar of democracy. If we don't trust the judiciary, democracy is going to fade. I promise you that's going to happen. Thanks, Dan. Um, Naima, okay, any comments? Well, awesome. Sorry, go on. <laughs> sorry to cross you, Naima. I just want to remind ahead, participants that you can you can raise your hand, you can uh, uh, jump into the discussion, you can be promoted as well uh, by the moderator, well, not the technical moderators um, who are standing by to assist. So just, you know, please feel free to jump into the discussion. Naima? Yeah, just, just a couple of things on Donovan's original question, which is the, the, the divide between your personal and your, your professional life and how much that divide is fading. Because if you, if you want to keep in touch with people, if you want to be able to reach out to people, you are also exposing yourself, your, your image, your reputation by interacting on these social platforms. And that's what they are. They're social. So the society therefore has opportunity and access to it. And you become far more mindful, bordering paranoid about the things that you say and do. And so those considerations affect you. And I, I think about judges, as Dan said, we have been trying for so long to not have our judges feel as though they can't interact with people and socialize because of the fear of the um, perception of bias. But the way things are going, you are being judged as an individual far more broadly than you used to. So the more you, you expose yourself by socializing on these social platforms, the more you're, you're naturally exposed to that kind of perception. It's 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 
good and it's bad in the sense that you get to get a sense of who someone is but if you put out like like um dan said you put out something that you would want to be forgotten having it forgotten is a problem that that's the issue yeah maybe and, i should uh, uh, oh sorry Kay. sorry no sorry i was just i want to dovetail on what naima was saying in response to donovan your question because here as practitioners, um, the issue that we have is that our legal profession act is not in step with what we are facing currently as, so this, as attorneys and as, and as attorneys practicing in an internet age. So how far is too far? Uh, what do we do? Where are the guidelines? Is a website a form of advertising or is it a internet business card? Is it allowed? Is it not allowed? Uh, can you give information to your general information to your clients without appearing as though you are advertising or touting? There are so many of those issues which, um, although the Bar Association is trying to keep in step with it, the legislation is far behind and it might be useful to have regular guidelines where we have for us just like this, which will allow us to have guidelines which will, which will um, allow us as practitioners to feel a little more confident as to how we can go forward in our particular field um, until, of course, the legislation comes up to date. Uh, in Barbados, we do have a legal profession act. The bill is currently under discussion, but nowhere near um, it being tabled or passed as yet. But what you have uh, raised would be certainly one of the issues that we would have to face. I think that uh, uh, just a quick remark on, on, on Donald's question and, and the two other remarks, I'd be very, very specific in what I'm going to say now, uh, in addition to the fact that I already proposed that, uh, that, 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 that putting the presumption uh, uh, that putting the presumption of innocence at jeopardy should itself be a criminal offense. Um, I would say that any lawyer who were to produce as evidence or refer to social media in a court case should be disbarred. Boom. It's pretty clear. Everybody understands what I'm saying. That's the way it should be. Now, the, 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 uh, one of the questions that I see coming in from the audience is human rights abuses. And this is also very interesting what we see in Europe. Um, we see a tendency, a growing tendency in different European jurisdictions um, to hold corporations accountable for human rights abuses. Very interesting, because most of these human rights abuses, of course, do not take place in the European Union. Some do, but most do not. Um, and, and to the extent that the companies are in the European Union, of course, we have the problem of directorship liability, uh, knowledge, and so on and so forth. We have some very interesting cases, one in France now involving the, the cement factory Lafarge, uh, for human rights uh, abuses in Syria, uh, allegedly working with ISIS. Uh, first they won, and then the court cassation demanded a retrial. Uh, we see cases like that in Germany and so on and so forth. And we actually also saw an attempt uh, to, to, to try a case against Facebook for what happened in Myanmar, uh, where, we, where Facebook's platform was used to incite hatred against the Rohingya population, which fled to Bangladesh. We see that happening. We haven't seen the judgments yet. Um, and I'm just waiting to, 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 to see whether anybody would have the courage of trying that same kind of case before in the US under the alien tort statute, which also talks about human rights violations. Of course, we know in the US, the Supreme Court has not really decided whether corporate entities um, can be liable under the alien tort statute, but it's an open question whether foreign, um, whether American entities can, uh, foreign, foreign entities cannot, uh, and of course, most of these companies are American entities. So very interesting, and at the same time, just closing on this, we see universal jurisdiction growing more and more in terms of human rights abuses. So whoever sent this question, uh, I think there is hope uh, in the future that it will be more policed than it is today. And Dan, there's a question that was just posted by one of our attendees addressed to you. Um, yeah. asked, I don't know if you're seeing it. 
Yeah, to me, it's very clear. Uh, I, li I like clear rules. Uh, if anybody anybody adduces any evidence, social media, kick it out. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Respect the judges. Uh, respect that the, that they need to be serene. That they need to buy judgment in accordance to the, the facts and the law, and not public opinion. Yes, and it, just another comment for consideration by the three of you and indeed um, our wider participants, just to give a practical example, Dan, of what you're saying regarding human rights and about um, um, the abuse of process perhaps. Um, you would perhaps be well aware, but perhaps a lot of our um, or, or attendees might not be. There's a very important Facebook case I find in 2018, you may know about this case with Fred Muema, who was a prominent lawyer in Uganda, who successfully brought, brought proceedings in the Irish Supreme Court or High Court against Facebook. At first instance, the High Court ruled that Facebook must reveal the name of a Ugandan attorney who posted defamatory allegations of corruption against Mr. Moema under the pseudonym TVO. Facebook was, however, successful on appeal as it was felt that TVO would be exposed to arrest and ill treatment, perhaps even murder, at the hands of Ugandan authorities. And so you see the balance between the right to um, you being able to face your accuser, to know who TVO is in the case of Fred Moema, and the human rights abuses that could be meted out. And the Irish Court of Appeal was very well persuaded um, that perhaps TVO's identity should not be revealed. And I just wanted to know, Dan, your comments on, on that particular case, and also Naima and Kay, um, those particular circumstances. Well, yes, actually, the interesting thing is, of course, that the Irish Supreme Court passes some very important European cases more than they actually should. If you if if you if you look at the number of inhabitants in the <laughs> in Ireland compared to the rest of the European Union, and of course, the answer to that is that these companies are all based in Ireland, and therefore because of tax reasons mainly, uh, and that, uh, the, that the Irish Data Protection Agency seems to be the first port of call in many of those cases, even though there are decisions now uh, from especially the French Data Protection Agency that they assume competing jurisdiction with the DPA in Ireland. But we can go into that later, that procedural question. But it is true that many cases of, 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 of cross-European importance for the reasons that I just explained, which are mainly tax-driven, come from Ireland. The case that you that you mentioned is not the only one in which we see that the both the High Court and the Supreme Court has had to decide on whether or not to enjoin Facebook or other social media uh, to share IP addresses. And of course, the um, the, the policy of, of Facebook is that they need a court order, but they seem also to be very selective in terms of which courts uh, they accept as being as being as meeting some metaphysical criteria that that, that they that they seem to be the the judges uh, more or less arbitrary of. I don't think that anybody could say that the Irish court system is corrupt or anything like that. But but it it is it is interesting that sometimes they accept court orders and sometimes they they don't. I have a, a, an example of a court order that came down in Germany some time ago in joining in joining. Um, uh, Google to share information, and Google decided that it would censor the court order because they felt that the conclusions did not follow from the premise. I mean, that's pretty arrogant in my opinion, but that's what they did. So anyway, they, 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 either it's a court order or it's not the court order. I agree that a court order comes from a country that is known not to have a, a stable legal system. It's different from Germany and, and, and Ireland. Okay, now having said that, the question of sharing IP addresses is, of course, closely linked to the to justified uh, anonymity. Justified anonymity seems today to be um, uh, inextricably linked, as the European Court of Justice says, um, to free speech. 
the new kind of free speech that we have with the internet, uh, which is a different animal from the free speech that we had before the internet, uh, where anonymity was not really that important. But today it is felt that if you don't have anonymity, you don't have free speech. At least that's the theory uh, under the First Amendment. And so, so when you do crime investigation, forensic investigation, I actually participated in one some years ago together with Interpol and Young on a pedophile ring. And you can imagine that was pretty bad stuff. And getting the IP addresses of 60,000 visitors of pedophile, of pedophile um, websites was not an easy task since most of them were not based in Europe. Many of them, unfortunately, in the Philippines where they had to supply this pedophile uh, pornographic pictures for reason of their own survival. It was very complicated. So, it, but but we did but we did end, end up getting quite a lot of IP addresses because this is something that is considered to be, um, to, which is also subject of of, of 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 international treaties. For instance, the Budapest Treaty, uh, which which directly talks about a pedophile and all uh, pedophile crimes, uh, and it also and then there's the Warsaw Treaty that talks about about terrorism. Right, so if it is sites that deal with that, uh, these big social media will typically share the IP information in question. But 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 it is it is an extremely difficult judgment call. Uh, I do not uh, in any way envy the judges, whether they are German or Irish or whatever, when they have to strike that call. It could of course be very helpful if, if the rules were clearer. Um, but I, I honestly don't think that we can make very, very clear rules on this. It is a judgment call. Is anonymity absolutely necessary to preserve the life of the individual? And is that individual's opinion so important that it serves a democratic purpose? I think these are the two questions. And, and, and I, I don't see how we can legislate anything more precise than that. Yeah, thanks for that comment, Brian. And um, from... The perspective of the Caribbean, Naima and Belize, Kay and Barbados, are there any um, developments pertaining to um, whether judge-driven case law or in statutes that seek to um, protect identity in the name of um, justice and free speech? Um, in Belize, what we have are provisions that allow the police to access information um, in the prosecution of crimes. I think that is as close as we've gotten to being um, centered on what technology is doing here. So the, the police now have, there's now a provision that allows the police to um, require or tele, telephone companies to produce information. We're talking text messages calls at this point in time. I don't think we've gotten to the place where IP addresses are being um, provided, but there is a recognition of the need when prosecuting crimes for, for information to be given to, to allow the proper prosecution and, and, and investigation of crimes. That's, that's as far as we've gotten so far. And here in Barbados, the position is very similar, um, particularly with matters that are criminal matters, you will have the assistance of the telecommunication company in seeking to uh, identify the perpetrators of a particular crime. Um, with respect to defamation, um, I don't think we've had that level of robust argument in respect of justified anonymity. Um, maybe that is the peculiarity of a small jurisdiction um, even when people speak behind a pseudonym, the truth is, is that in a small jurisdiction, you tend to know who the person is. And um, uh, we actually are dealing with a defamation case right now with, um, with, a, with a client of mine. And um, the, certainly there's been no protection of that nature to this point for the person who made the defamatory remarks. So again, we don't have the same level of protection and, and, um, and rights as uh, Dan alluded to. And at this stage, I can't say that we really uh, have had a robust legal argument on the protection of a pseudonym or the right to free speech.
versus the defamatory remark is made. How are things in Jamaica, Donovan? Well, uh, and thanks for that. I was just about to share with everyone that in 2020, after years of debate, excited by the GPDR rules coming out of Europe, Jamaica passed a very robust and very fulsome Data Protection Act. So on the one hand, the legislators went and um, really drove us into the um, 21st century with an act that was based on the very highest standards. So on the one hand, we have the law, but in terms of actually receiving from our legislator the effective date of the law, that has not yet been enforced. The regulations for the law have not yet been um, put in place. And the data commissioner um, to whom we can appeal um, has not been um, um, appointed. So effectively, we have a wonderful piece of paper sitting in our parliament um, that says, hey, okay, we have this law, but there are no mechanisms for enforcement, there are no mechanisms for administration, and there's no effective date as yet. So we're still in a wait and see. But once that law is passed, I think that we will have very similar standards of data protection, the right to be forgotten, and all of the various matters that, that Dan mentioned. Um, again, the um, folks in Europe seem to be moving ahead. And for instance, the Digital Governance Act that Dan mentioned, again, this is something that's fairly, it was very new. And of course, our legislators will be looking at it. The interesting thing about our Data Protection Act, though, which is not yet in force, um, says that because the legislature recognized that this area is robust and is changing very quickly. They have, um, they have, apologies. They have said that in the legislature, the last section says every five years, this particular act is to be reviewed. And I think it, it recognized the fact that this area is evolving and this area is growing. So that's really what's happening in Jamaica. Um, we have not had any, to my mind, I'm thinking, I, I don't recall any cases that deals with this particular um, point about disclosing or preventing the disclosure of person's identities. So, um, that's it in relation to Jamaica. But we have a few more minutes. And I uh, maybe, maybe I'll just address very quickly uh, the, the remedies question, having the experience of, of course. Having, having the benefit of the experience of over three years now with the, with the GDPR. Where we have you. remedies, we have remedies that really work because we have a data protection agency. And of course, the data protection agency in France, the CNIL, has seen to be the most aggressive in the European Union came down with a fine of 50 million euros against the Google for uh, not obtaining consent to prefigured installed apps on Android. Uh, and that has inspired other data protection agencies throughout the European Union. The remark I want to make is that since you are now uh, enacting something similar in Jamaica, you may find the following practical experience of use, which is that when trying cases before the data protection agency or court, um, the problem is not so much the fines. Uh, the problem is that when you present, when you represent private individuals that have been hurt by data violations and breach, data breaches and so on, they get zills, they get nothing because they can't prove the prejudice, they can't prove the loss. That's at least the way it works in Europe. And that's why I've also suggested and highly recommended to the European Commission that within the Data Services Act, the DSA, when we're talking about uh, uh, liability, uh, especially for data violations and for also for hate speech and so on, that we should in Europe allow two things, which you may have, or may, you may have the, the, the class action cases already. I don't know whether you have it or not, but we don't have it in Europe. And I'm strongly advocating that we need, in addition to the data protection agencies, 
uh, ability to levy fines, we need a class action sui generis remedy in Europe with, with, with minimum damages because you can't prove the damage. How do you want to prove the damage of you being, being harassed or you being subject, being a part of a group that is that is that that's been that the, is targeted for hate speech reasons, or that you lost your data, and so on and so forth. You can't prove it. So this this, this is this is becoming an, an increasing problem. I had a discussion with the Information Commission in the, U, in the UK about it. They're trying to see what they can do. Since you are uh, since you are haven't yet enacted your law in Jamaica, maybe you want to introduce this already now at the initial stage. This is something that is needed because the beauty. Of having, um, of having this remedy for the individual and not, not just in terms of fines, is that it creates a culture, a culture where the individual feels that he's back in the driver's seat, that it is that he's, he's, he's regained his, 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 his ability to be the center of his own universe and control his own life. This is so important. So it's not just a question of, of, of filing a complaint with the DPA and then see what's happening. It is getting it is getting your, the, the remedy yourself all the way and getting monetary compensation for the harm that was inflicted upon you. That's what it's all about. Thanks, Dan. So, um, I'll, I'll just read in here because we have about five minutes to go uh, before we take our break. Um, and uh, there's also some comments in the chat. Um, Lisa Taylor, first, she gives a, a shout out to Kay, her former housemate, as she says. Um, and, and then she also asks a very interesting question. Is it feasible? Uh, for is it feasible to aim for commonality of rules concerned with the acceptable limitations to the right of freedom of expression in the Commonwealth Caribbean? And I think that's a very interesting question. It goes to certainly issues of constitutionality in terms of how our constitutions are um, currently configured in, in terms of those rights. And um, uh, in terms of commonality, uh, what, what was clear from the discussion is, is that in the region, um, the DPA, the, the Data Protection Acts um, that have been enacted so far and are slowly being brought into force um, is relatively new, right? So this is a relatively new area for all of us um, in Jamaica and Barbados, certainly. And so there, there is uh, the capacity, there is the opportunity uh, for greater collaboration um, amongst our states in terms of how we are going to develop the jurisprudence around these issues. Um, as, as we roll out our, our legislative regimes. Um, but uh, who would like to take that question? I, I think it's very, um, uh, in terms of thinking about collaboration, you know, we have, we have OCBA here um, representing the, the uh, bar associations from across the region. How do we think about uh, coming up with common rules um, concerned with how we make that, that necessary balance between the right of freedom of expression in the Commonwealth Caribbean, in our constitutions, and the uh, data protection regulations and laws that are coming uh, into play uh, more and more. Um, I, I could try and take that from a regional perspective. Sure. Again, you are absolutely correct. ACBA could be a leading voice in getting the various bar associations involved in this particular area. And in terms of doing research and getting common legislation in place, the Justice Project at the University of the West Indies, I believe Professor Velma Newton chairs that project. It's well-funded primarily by the Canadian government. Um, that is something, and they have been looking at common legislation and common um, um, issues that face the region. And maybe this is something well worth um, Professor Newton and her team looking at. So Akba could look at it from a bar association perspective and in terms of um, common legislation or sample legislation, the, um, the University of Western Indies Justice Project could look at it as well. So I agree with you and, and, and the person who asked the question that that's important. I just want to make a point in relation to the Data Protection Act in Jamaica quickly. That law is actually passed in Jamaica. It is law, but it just doesn't have an effective date. But I take Dan's point that um, we can look at modernizing it or to improve it because this area is moving very quickly. Um, I know where time is upon us, and I did have one last comment, unless there were 
more questions from the chat. I just wanted to join with you, Donovan, quickly to say, to join with the call for collaboration across the region. Uh, very quickly, hello, Lisa. Very fond memories of our law school days. Um, but um, yes, I want to really emphasize that because we very much uh, like Jamaica. Our um, data protection act has been passed. It is in law. The rules are currently not yet in force. We do not have a data commissioner. There is a reality in the region that these that legislation requires funding in order for it to work. And in the region, you know, uh, funding is, is, has to be spread quite thinly. And I, I believe that as a region with similar constitutions and similar interests, there, there's much that we can gain by way of collaboration. Totally agreed, Kay. Well, on that, um, I'll try to bring this discussion to an end. I know we could talk and talk on this forever. Um, many, many issues. Uh, regarding the law, uh, the internet and society in terms of the changes that we have seen so far and are continuing to see. Um, thank you so much to all of you, Naima, Dan, Kay, Donovan, thank you um, for all of your contributions to this um, tremendous discussion today.